Okay, you can find your way back to your seats. Who is excited for Christmas? Woo! It is like right around that corner. Where, where did this year go? Who knows? <laughs> well, educate them then. Um, so I, I am so excited about preaching at Christmas. Preaching at Christmas is so much easier than the rest of the year because your, your topic is just assigned to you. It's Christmas. <laughs> just talk about Christmas. You can't really go wrong. Um, and specifically this year, we're talking about Simply Christmas, which when we came up with it as a staff, just really got my thoughts going on what to, what to speak about, what to preach about. Um, I am a cook, and I love cooking, and so when I think about Simply Christmas, I was like, oh, so we're making a Christmas reduction. We're going to see... <laughs> We're going to see what happens when I put Christmas in a pot and just boil it for a very long time. What are you left with at the end? Um, And what kind of meat do you serve it with? But we're going to make a Christmas reduction this morning. We're going to boil down Christmas. We're going to look right to the heart. What is there when you boil away all the other things, all the traditions and all the decorations and all the things that we've slapped on it? What's left when you take all of that away? And don't get me wrong. I love Christmas traditions. We have many Christmas traditions as a family that are very sacred to me. Um, We always open one present on Christmas Eve. It's always the same thing. It's pajamas. Thank you, Tyler. Um, But we'll pretend to be surprised anyway. And then, you know, you go to bed, but you don't sleep. You just stare at the ceiling. Uh, And then in the morning, we wake up and, like, get to go out to the tree. But, of course, don't you can't wake up before the agreed-upon time because for every hour that mom is awake before that time, she will remove presents from the tree. And so finally, Tyler and Liam and I, we would just wake up at some awful hour and just go sit on the couch and stare at the tree and the presents vibrating like a phone getting too many texts, but you can't touch it. You have to just stare at it. And then finally mom and dad wake up and they will make their tea and they will take their sweet time making that tea and you can't touch the presents until the tea is ready. Then we will all go to the living room to open the presents and mom passes out the presents and, uh, you know, you get those moments where I get to open a present that says from mom and dad and dad is just as surprised as I am to see what's in that box. (laughs) And then... Dad opens a present that says, from Santa, and Mom is surprised as he opens a new power tool. It's a great... (laughs) Christmas traditions are wonderful. They're just, they're so fun. But we need to get past Christmas traditions sometimes. Because ultimately, traditions, they're great, but they're just the tinsel that we use to decorate our time instead of our tree. They are, they're part of this season, but they're ultimately like baubles. And we need to cut past that and get back to simply Christmas and really evaluate because if our Christmas traditions are clouding our ability to see what this season is all about, then they have to go. And we've been looking at the Christmas story over the past two weeks and then this Sunday uh, through the perspective of different characters that were there in the biblical story in Luke. Um, Pastor Tom preached on Joseph and how he experienced that first Christmas. Pastor Danny preached on Mary. And this morning, as it says on the screen, I'm going to be preaching on the shepherds, and they're a great group of guys. I I hope you're going to like them. Um, But when I think about the shepherds, I really think about hope being what they represent. And I promise I did not tell Erica ahead of time before she picked her set that that's what I was going to be speaking on. That it's been. I actually asked her, I was like, hey, what what are you thinking for your worship set? Uh, Have you picked your worship set yet? This was like a week ago. She's like, I've had this set picked since April, so... (laughs) I was like, oh, that works out. The Holy Spirit's good. Um, But let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 2. And we're going to read about these shepherds. And we're just going to read a little short part of this story. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 12. Luke, of course, is part of the Gospels. So it's at the beginning of the New Testament. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Um, So find Luke there and go to Luke chapter 2. And we're going to read verse 8 to 12. And it says, oh, that's not the right one. I was like, what? Okay, here we go. Uh, And there were shepherds 
living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But that angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. So, taking apart what the angel is saying to them, looking at it through their eyes, I've picked out some things that seem very important. And the first thing is that the angel says that he brings great news or good news of great joy. And there's this partnering of joy with the message of Christmas right there in the very fabric of the DNA of Christmas. One of the first Christmas messages proclaimed is about how this news that we're receiving is going to be joyful. And this idea of hope and joy at Christmas, I mean, from an earthly perspective, it can be very difficult. Hope and joy in our world, they're not abundant anymore. I mean, all you have to do is watch the news. Around the world, there's tyrants waging war on each other. There's climate change causing cities to go underwater and some other cities to completely lose their water. There's people protesting and lighting things on fire. There's refugees fleeing war zones. There's population explosions that experts don't know what's happening. And worst of all, Costco has stopped carrying the sausage I really like. And I'd appreciate your prayers in this difficult time. But you can even see it in the media we watch that there's, there's a lack of hope. There's a changing in how we as humanity have started to view the future. Even in the last 50 years, you look at media, television, movies from the 60s that picture the future. And it's like the Jetsons. Like flying cars and the humans have achieved world peace and there's robot butlers. Uh, and then you look at our movies from today that picture the future, and it's like, how do you plan to survive the post-apocalyptic wasteland? Because <laughs> that, that's all that we see now. When it's pictures of the future in the worldly and in the natural, there's no hope. And there's very little joy. And so when we spend a lot of time, as I do, looking at the news and, and keeping up on these things that are going around the world, it can become very confusing how we're supposed to have hope, and let alone joy, amidst all these struggles and all the turmoil. And yet the Bible says in Romans to have joy in hope, to be joyful in hope. Turn with me to Romans chapter 15, verse 13. If you were already in Luke, it's really close by. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope... Fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. How can we have hope? That's how we can have hope. The God of hope gives us joy and peace as we trust in him. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can overflow with hope. And there's this link there between having hope, having joy, and having peace. These are not isolated concepts, but Christmas is teaching us about those things working together. That as we see that hope, as we take our eyes off of all the things that are going on in the world, all the things that press for our attention, that alarm and, and cry, and instead we look up and we see Jesus, we see the hope that he represents, we also get to unbuckle that weighted vest of hopelessness and instead we get to put on the garments of joy that he has prepared for us. But we have to make sure that we're not focusing on the impossible, but we're focusing on what God has said is possible through him. And this season, really, when I think about Christmas, that hope and that joy going hand in hand, they're integral to how we experience this time of year. The angel saying to the shepherds, I have good news of great joy. The good news there is the gospel. He's not saying I have good news. There's a sale on at Ronson Shoes. You can finally have joy. He's saying there's good news, it's Jesus Christ. And when our hope and our joy is built on that foundation, instead of a foundation of things that we just see around us, but instead is built on the foundation of who Jesus is and what his message is, 
that's a foundation that's unshakable. And our joy and our hope will last through so much more. But directly after that, the angel says another thing to the shepherds. This page keeps turning on its own. The angel says about the great joy and the good news, and then he says it's for all the people. Now, I love the shepherds, and one of the reasons I love the shepherds is because they are shepherds. And that sounds pretty obvious. I couldn't personally be a shepherd. Um, I like lamb way too much. Those lambs would not be safe with me. Um, We were driving one time as a family in northern BC, and we passed, um, I was like seven, and we were driving, and we passed at the side of the road, there was a whole bunch of elk in a field that was fenced. And seven-year-old me, I was like, what's that? And my parents explained, oh, that's an elk farm. They're raising elk on a farm. And in my head, I was appalled because in my little seven-year-old brain, I was like, no, no, no. There are farm animals, and there are non-farm animals, and you can't do this mixing thing. No, no, no. And so I didn't tell, I didn't explain that to them. I just said, that's wrong. And so then for the, a bit more of the drive, my parents are like, oh, man, maybe we have an animal activist on our hands, potentially a vegetarian. And which there's nothing wrong with vegetarianism. I love vegetarianism. But they were going to test the theory to see whether that's how I was leaning then or not, because later we passed a farm that had a whole bunch of lambs on it, and I have loved lamb since I was very young. So this was the moment they decided to break it to me that the lamb that we eat is actually at the side of the road right now. And so they're like, look, a lamb farm. And I didn't tell them that that was appalling. Instead, I said, pass the mint sauce. (laughs) Because I just love, I love some lamb. Love some Christmas lamb. Actually, lamb any time of year. But... (laughs) These shepherds, the fact that they're shepherds is very significant. I mean, it's significant for so many reasons. It's like metaphorical, and there's all these layers to it. But for me, what's so significant about it is that they're not kings. They're not the most wealthy people in their neighborhood. They're not the most powerful, the most politically connected. They're not... Uh, the ones that have, you know, most access to religious rites and rituals. They're not the ones who live in the temple. They're not the priests. They're not anyone important. They're just shepherds. They're even the graveyard shift of shepherds. Like, that's low. And yet it is to them that the angels appear and declare that this message of hope is for all people. What an amazing message. What an amazing God we serve that his message of hope is for all people. Regardless of where you're from, regardless of the color of our skin, our gender, what we've done, what length our hair is, or what we choose to eat, the message of Christmas is for us. The message of Christmas is for every single person. And it's right there at the very start of Jesus' life being proclaimed by an angel that this message is for all the people which is why it absolutely breaks my heart when I see people who wear the name Christian acting so discriminatory. And in our world today, it's so easy to fall into into it. I mean, anyone who's on Facebook, you've seen it. It just, it makes me so sad to see people dividing instead of uniting, drawing lines and saying, no, you know, this message is actually not for that group of people, whether it's a group of people based on race or a group of people based on political affiliation or a group of people based on anything. We have got to stand for the universality of the Christmas message, that it is for everyone. And I, I am guilty of this. I am, we're all guilty of this in some way because as humans, it's something that constantly tempts us. We love to divide. We love to put things in boxes and to separate and to draw lines and to create walls. And God is about tearing walls down. And so when we talk about the hope of Christmas, we have to keep in mind that, yes, it's for us, but it is for every person around us as well. And even the people we haven't met. There isn't a person alive on earth that the Christmas message has skipped. It's for every person. And those shepherds represent that, not just in the fact that they are shepherds, but that the angel met them right where they were, out in the fields. They didn't have to go to the temple. 
They didn't have to go to a church service. Right where they were, the angel came and proclaimed the message of the gospel to them. And that, I mean, that resonates with me because God didn't make me jump through hoops to hear his message. He met me right where I was. He didn't make me change first. He didn't make me stop sinning. He didn't make me wear the right clothes or do the right things. First, I heard the message and let the change come after that. I am a huge Lord of the Rings nerd. And you will hear about Lord of the Rings a lot from me. That's because it's holy. Um, One of our Christmas traditions is that every year, um, Leanne, myself, and my brother Tyler started this where we we watch all three Lord of the Rings movies during the month of December. It's because those are Christmas movies. And we we watch them. But in, in the Lord of the Rings... There's this concept of, you know, the enemy, the good, good guys and bad guys. You've all heard these sorts of stories. And yes, the bad guy, he has armies and he has weapons, but one of the things he has at his disposal that he uses most effectively is the ability to place despair and dread in the hearts of people. But conversely, the good guys, the ones who fight for love and justice and righteousness, have the power to inspire hope in those around them. And when Tolkien wrote that, he must have been looking at something in the spirit realm because that reflects our reality. Because we have an enemy who would love to rob us of our hope. Not just us, but everybody. To sow despair and hopelessness and dread in the world. But God has given us the power to inspire hope. That's one of the weapons in our arsenal. Is that we don't just ask people to come to church because we want them to sit in a warm chair. We have the power to go out and everywhere that the enemy has sown despair, we can place hope in that spot because we have this message that was proclaimed to these shepherds and is proclaimed to us. Also, go watch Lord of the Rings. (laughs) And this is really part of the Christmas story is that we now have a responsibility If you look further in the story in Luke, Luke 2, 15 to 18, they've had this proclaimed to them, these shepherds, and it says, um, oh man, it keeps turning this one page and really throwing me off. Uh, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Right there, the first evangelists. (laughs) They walk up, they see Jesus, and they just start telling everybody. And in a world that was so, so dark, they become some of the first people to carry forth the light of Christmas, which is a tradition that we get to participate in even to this day. And part of why I am burned about Christmas tradition and why I'm, I'm so looking this year, even at my own, and saying, are they important? What are they doing? Are they just fun or are they getting in the way? Is because I don't ever want my Christmas traditions to make Christmas about me and to make Christmas about my experience. Did I have a fun Christmas? Did I open enough presents? Did I get to enough dinners? Was it all good for me? Because if I have the worst Christmas of my life, but I managed to walk out into the world and share some of the light that has been shared with me, then it was actually the best Christmas. And I, of course, I want us all to have a great Christmas, but let's not forget why we even celebrate, what we're here for, that like those shepherds, yes, we on Christmas, we get to come and we get to see Jesus, and then we need to turn and we need to go out and we need to tell everyone else. Because Jesus really is the hope that we have. Like we're talking about hope, we're talking about Christmas. What do we hope in? Why do we have hope? It's Jesus. And it's again going back to that angel saying, today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. That's why we have hope. We don't hope in a thing. We don't hope in a circumstance. We hope in a person. 
We hope in Jesus who has snatched us from the mouth of the lion, who has rescued us from the fires of hell, who when we are drowning has reached down and pulled us up to stand on the waves beside him. We worship Jesus who when we were in our most lost dark moment found us and brought us light. And he is asking us to go out, find those other people who are lost and help bring them into the light with us. If you'll indulge me, which you're going to because I'm on stage and have a microphone and that gives me immense power apparently. Let's all just close our eyes for a second and let the movie of this moment play in our heads. You can picture the shepherds out there in the field. It's dark. It's nighttime. This is well before electricity, so you don't even have much ambient light. It's that kind of half light, you know, the starlight that makes everything monochromatic. It's all gray. There's some sheep bleating in the field nearby. And then suddenly, the angel of the Lord appears, and that darkness is illuminated by light. But this isn't like the light of the sun. This isn't like the light of a torch. It says that the glory of the Lord shone around them. I picture it like the light is enveloping them. It is coming from everywhere at the same time. You can open your eyes. That is what we get to experience at Christmas, the banishment of darkness from our lives, that when the hope of God comes in, it's not a glimmer in the distance. The hope that we have is not a little speck that we have to try and find. It is around us. It shines more brightly than anything else, and it casts no shadow. That's the hope that we celebrate. So when I think about Christmas, when I think about hope, that's what I think about. That hope really is, this time of year really is celebrating going from darkness to light. Going from being lost to being found. So my challenge this morning for all of us is that as we go into these next couple days before Christmas, I'm sure... We have all sorts of things, Christmassy things that are going to be done, whether by us or to us. With every Christmas dinner that we go to, with every gift we unwrap, with every carol that we sing, let's remember why we do it. Let's be intentional this Christmas season to not let any moment slip us by. But for every single thing that happens this season, let's say, thank you, God, that I'm doing this because of the hope that you gave to me. Let's pray. I'm going to ask the worship team also to come back up and lead us in uh, another song. God, we, we come before you this morning and we just worship you and we thank you for all that you've done and all that you are, God, that we can boldly proclaim that the baby who was born on Christmas saved our lives. God, that this season isn't just for us, but it is for the entire world, God, and that you have asked us to be your partner in sharing that light and that hope with others. God, for those in this room who feel like hope is far off to them, like this season is not one of hope, but is more often one of dread, God, I just pray for your light to come and envelop them, God, for a renewing of hope where there is despair, God, that each and every person, God, this Christmas would experience your love like never before, your joy like never before, and your peace like never before. You can keep your eyes closed. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, but you would like to, just by raising your hand, we can pray and you can receive him into your life. Is there anyone like that? God, as we continue this morning to worship you, to think about you and all that you've done for us, God, would you just open our hearts to hear the message of Christmas in a fresh way. In Jesus' name.
Thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, don't forget that there will be people here at the front. If you need prayer for anything, whether it's something we've talked about this morning or otherwise, please come and get prayer. Uh, don't forget that on Christmas Eve, which is on in two days, we have two services, 4.30 and 6 o'clock. Come, bring your families. Anyway, Merry Christmas. God bless you.